obviously the first thing that's going to grab you is do you think it's good looking? If it's if you are attracted to the design physically, then that's one half of the battle is over. But how does it, you know, does it really deliver on that promise, you know? Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 128 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. And I'm Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies, knife junkies, anyone on the spectrum in between that loves to learn about knives and knife collecting, then you are in the right place because our Sunday interview show is where we get to hear from knife designers, knife makers, knife manufacturers, knife reviewers, knife lovers, knife podcasters. And that's what we have today, a knife lover and a knife podcaster. Bob, who's our guest today? Uh, today we have Levon from the Knife Nuts podcast, the Knife Nuts podcast, the the one that started it all. I think it was the very first. Uh, and if not the very first, it is um, it is one that everyone loves and goes to because it's got four. Uh, the show has four great personalities from from a wide range of perspectives. And uh, they're funny and they're fun. And you can just learn a lot about the knife industry and what's coming up in the knife world from them. And uh, Levon, if you follow him on Instagram, he is your inside source. I swear to God, he's your inside source on what's coming because he seems to have every knife in his hot little hands uh, before anyone else. And and I discover what's coming out uh, frequently from from his Instagram feed. Uh, it was a great pleasure talking to him. He's a very knowledgeable guy, uh, funny and fun. And so it was great to talk to him. Well, let's uh, not wait any further. Let's hear the conversation here on the Knife Junkie podcast. Visit the Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. I'm here with Levon from the Knife Nuts podcast. Levon, thank you for joining me on the Knife Junkie podcast. Are you kidding me? Thank you for having me. This is insane. It is my pleasure. So when I um, think of you, uh, two things come to mind, and this is mostly from your Instagram feed. Okay. Because you are constantly amazing me with uh, what you've got in hand. Mm -hmm. And two words come to mind. One is Maven. And uh, Maven, I know it sounds like a, an old lady. It sounds like matronly. But a Maven is someone who spreads information throughout the culture. Uh, it's so funny. Yeah. First off, thank you for uh, thinking of me. That's very sweet. <laughs> uh, two, I told uh, uh, the guys in the Knife Nuts podcast that you called me a Maven. And they uh -huh. couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, why is that? Uh, it's just it just sounds know, at my expense. It's funny, you know. You, you're a you're a nice a nice maven with a with a little blue bonnet, and you're also a taste maker. Uh, to me, I mean, because I see I see your stuff, I see the knives you get. You seem to get things before anyone else, or things that I've only heard echoed on the winds, and you have them in hand. Where does this love of knives come from, and where do all of these knives, these incredible things uh, that you get in hand, come from? Uh, well, I mean, I think like anybody, uh, everybody, I've always liked knives, you know, I can't say that there was a time when I didn't like them. I mean, obviously, I didn't expect them to become part of, uh, you know, a hobby and then a almost a job sort of situation. But uh, as far as, uh, you know, I'm lucky to have the friends that I do. Um, my best friend, Jake, who's also on the podcast, he's a uh, He's like a renaissance man, you know, he's, he's, he's a tinkerer, he's a, you know, automotive technician and, and teacher. Um, so when we get into something, we really, really get into it, whether it's been cars or knives, you know, it's always been from a very technical standpoint. And that was, you know, we, he got me into them, what, uh, probably 10 years ago now, I guess it was around 2010, we started messing around, like, you know, i I bought a buck from uh, from Cabela's and carried that around with me. You know, it wasn't anything spectacular. It was a spring assisted buck. It wasn't a one ten. You know, it wasn't a grandpa's knife. Mm -hmm. And from there, I got a griptilian, and and things you know start to go a little further from there. I think you have that. Everybody has those gateway knives. You know that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as far as you know, m as my friendships developed, and, and you meant you, you and I were talking about this before before we started recording, but you mentioned Jeff Blavel. Blavel being a local guy. 
I, I happen to be in an area that is very dense with knife makers, some very dense knife makers, but <laughs> but there's a lot of them. I mean, John Gray's here, um, Borka Blades, you know, Sebastian Berengi. Uh-huh. He, these are really good friends of mine who all, you know, live 20 minutes away from me. We used to hang out every night. So I was surrounded by knife makers and, you know, they changed, they, my perspective on the entire industry changed because I was a collector and then I'm, I'm in the middle of, of it, of the whole thing. You see what happens behind the scenes. You see, you hear all the drama. You see what goes into making each one of these things. And then my friendship with, with Brian Nadeau took that to another level. My appreciation for, for machine stuff. And obviously we talk about that with, with Jake and being a natural tinkerer. Oh, we have Dave on the show too. He's just a smart guy. And you put us all in the same place and it's it just, you know, you can't, you tend to know what to look for when you're looking at a good knife. Well, that's the beauty of the Knife Nuts podcast is the, is the four perspectives and they all, uh, you all have your own voices and, and you can all tell your friends. And I think, uh, people like to hear that, but they yeah. also really like to hear when you get in the weeds because you have the perspective of someone like Brian, who who is in the you know up up to his ankles in it all day long every day, and uh, and then and then everyone else's perspective adds to that uh, well, the complexion of what it is to be a, a sure. knife collector or a knife maker. Yeah, I mean the, the dynamic that we have, I think, is something special. You know, we're, we may not have the most uh, informative podcast out there by any stretch of the imagination, um, but we have we have a good time. And we all learn from each other and respect each other quite a bit. Despite what you might hear on the show, we all are, you know, pretty inseparable. And I wouldn't, I couldn't do it with, without them. How'd you get it started? Well, it started in the, the seeds for it started around the end of 2016. I had actually had, um, I was laid up for a while. I had my Achilles tendon reattached. Oh. So at the time, Brian and I had already been friends for a while, but we were talking like every day because he would talk to me about what he was planning on doing and he would bounce stuff off of me and we would have a good time chatting and sometime and I would talk to Jake all the time and I would, I was always listening to, I'm not really a podcast listener, but at the time I was listening to the modern Neanderthal podcast. Mm. Um, I don't know if you remember that one with, uh, Epic Snuggle Bunny and, and a couple of the other guys. I do remember that. Yeah. But I said, you know, I, I, we could do this because I always found myself like yelling at the, at the, the screen or whatever audio system I was listening to <laughs> it on. And, uh, I said, why don't we do this? I got nothing but time right now. You obviously have a lot to say, Brian. J- Jake, you're a smart guy. Dave actually went to school. If you know Philadelphia, he went to Villanova University. Nice. He doesn't live local to me anymore, but that's how we got to know each other. And his negative perspective on things always cracked me up anyway. So I said, let's, let's try and get something together. Well, I knew him from Misanthropia, his yep. uh, YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. And, 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 uh, I always thought that the name was a contrast. He, he seems like a great guy <laughs> just from his, uh, yeah. you know, from his review videos. Well, we're all, that. we're all metal fans too. Like we all uh, listen to some really dark metal music. So that was a, that was, that's the ties that bind there, but at least between. Uh, Dave, Jake, and I, and Brian listens to a lot of crazy stuff too. We've been to concerts as well. So, how do your tastes align, and how do they differ in knives? I honestly would say they align very heavily, and I think that might be just a byproduct of us spending a lot of time together and really appreciating what what we ha- what knives we have and what we handle. Uh, Dave still has like a crush on Emerson's to a oh. certain. We all have like a guilty pleasure sort of thing, you know, but. Uh, it's, a, I don't know. We just, it's got to be a good knife. It may not be a, always be a knife that we love or carry every day, but we can still appreciate a good knife. So, okay. So how do you, how do you define that? Is it quality of the build? Uh, you know, especially if we're talking about the four of you in concert, we will be talking about you alone in a minute, but if we're talking about the four of you in concert, do you feel, uh, beholden uh, to the fact that you're you're there with Brian Nadeau, who is one of the most uh, you know amazing knife makers out there, that uh, that there has to be a certain level of quality, even though you might be compelled by a design or or some other aspect of a knife that you would otherwise be ashamed to admit. Absolutely, I mean it's like anything else. Like you think about cars. Obviously, the first thing that's going to grab you is do you think it's good looking? If it's 
if you are attracted to the design physically, then that's one half of the battle is over. But how does it, you know, does it really deliver on that promise, you know? And learning from Brian, learning from John Gray, learning all the different ways there are to make something, you expect, you you look for different things based on the way it was built. You know, uh, that goes a, a long way into determining how how I react to a certain knife, whether it's a production knife, a handmade custom, somewhere in between, or something that Brian takes a, you know, mathematically perfect approach to. Okay, so you say perfect, and, and uh, Brian Nadeau is on this podcast, and when he was, uh, when we were talking, I, I very shamelessly said that I thought, I thought the arch nemesis is the perfect folding knife. It's just perfect, perfect. I, I've got to tell you that I probably agree with you there. Uh, I think that's that's one of that's the pinnacle. Now, what's interesting now is that you see his a lot of the things that he learned from doing the arch nemesis dagger, and you see it in that void excel, like the, a lot of the, the the very 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 complex contouring, just some really 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 neat stuff. So, do you think uh, you've indicated that? Well, I mean, we all know you have a you have a broad community of people uh, who are actually making knives. Does knowing uh, a knife maker liking a knife maker and knowing their individual story um, change how you might see their work uh, in other words does it draw you to something you otherwise might not be initially drawn to uh, I would say I would like to say no but I feel like that's there's something about that of course if I like the person and I like the story and I, I appreciate that everything they put into uh, a product, then it's easier, f- and of course, price is part of it. Available, all that stuff is is a t- are tangibles, but th- it's the intangibles that you can uh, you can put back into the product yourself, um, and depending on what you see in that person and their process. I don't know if that made any sense, it was yeah, yeah, no, no, it totally does. And actually, speaking of process and and the fact that you are so close with, say, Brian, what do you see from your close but outside perspective? of a knife knife maker when they're going through that process of, uh, you know, conceiving of a knife all the way through production. Believe it or not, Brian does play a lot of the stuff very close to his chest, even when he's designing something. It's only when he gets to the the point where one thing is done and, and another thing has to happen that you see, like, because that's the way he feeds his family, you know? You see him panic. You know that that's, that's, their, that's his livelihood. It's not... I mean, it's different for different makers who do it as part time. There's and then there's Brian who does it full time. It's how they eat. So there is a lot of stress and a lot of thought and constant, uh, you know, constant working. I mean, there are there are designs of Brian's that I haven't seen yet that nobody's seen yet. And, you know, he's just wondering what's the right thing to do at the right time. It's 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 a gamble. I could see that. And and then especially maybe in our climate right now and, and we see. I mean, we always see patriotism in the knife uh, mm. industry, um, and and then there's a lot of, especially right now, uh, a lot of talk about you know make sure you're buying U.S. and, and then you got to balance that. So Brian Nadeau, he's a U.S. knife maker, as U.S. as it comes, and yet still you know to have his designs produced in the most high fidelity sense uh, to 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 his vision, he goes to Riot, who makes an outstanding knife. I mean, what is that conflict? Well, I'm going to take full credit for this one because, uh, like you said, Brian is, uh, to not be cliche, as American as apple pie. And and that's a great thing. I, I, I definitely am a patriot. I work for an American company. I'm very proud of that. And I, I, I will support uh, American made as, as much as I can. Uh, the skilled labor in this country does not exist to, to produce products like Riyadh does. It just doesn't, you know? And if for someone like Brian who takes pride in his work and his, he's going to go to the best that he can. And he was very anti doing this in the beginning. I set him down with a bunch of products from, from a bunch of different makers, American, Mm -hmm. Chinese, whatever. And I said, this is the one that I think you should go with. And this was, you know, years ago. Uh, They see, they seem to have, and it was obviously it was Riyadh. And uh, it took him a while to come around, but when he did and he saw what they were capable of with the, the first one he did was that micro typhoon and they built it to his spec. They were able to, 
And it's different for Brian, too, than your like your average knife maker going to Riot and saying, hey, I want you to make this. Uh, you know, they may have a drawing on a napkin and say, hey, here, this is the knife. Can you guys engineer it? With Brian's stuff, it's a, it's a different story altogether because he's designing the whole thing, all the CAD files, the processes, everything. He's the composer. It's dialed in a thousand percent by the time it gets to Riyadh. Exactly. It's going to the world's best orchestra. You know, he's, he's mm -hmm. writing the symphony, he's conducting it, and he's giving it, and he's, he's letting the world's best orchestra play a song. So being someone who is um, intimately familiar with the, the custom knives and also the Riyadh knives, what are your impressions of, uh, of how they compare? I mean, they're better. I mean, you can't, you can't even, the truth of the story is, again, we were talking about the intangibles and the stuff that, and the work that people put into things and the process that people have. But if you're comparing side by side, you know, uh, you can take like a, a Lee Lerman. All right. That's, that's to me, as far as knife makers go, he's as good as they get. And I'm not just saying that because I own two of his knives. I own two of his knives because mm -hmm. I think he's the pinnacle. And you, and you put that next to a Riot knife. I mean, yeah, you're going to, they're going to, they're going to both be perfect, but the price discrepancy between the two of them mm -hmm. is astronomical. Right. Uh, but if, even if we're going, you know, apples to apples, you know, you're going from a, a Riot knife to, you know, a good custom knife, the Riot's going to be better, you know, like a handmade knife. It's just impossible. A human being cannot get to the tolerances that a machine can. I would like to preface that's not a knock on any custom knife by any stretch of the imagination. I have plenty of great custom knives that I carry and use every day. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think uh, no one would perceive it as such because yeah. it, it just, it just naturally follows that if you have a machine, you can program with a, you know, with a, with a file mm -hmm. and, and it has, you know, it can get so close, it can get so close, but that's not why you buy a handmade custom knife. There's of a course. different reason. It's got a soul, a different kind of soul. Anyway. Yeah. Your criteria for judging a knife in your collection. So first of all, um, I'm in awe of your Instagram feed on a daily basis. Oh my <laughs> God, that is beautiful. I want that. Or, oh my God, I heard about that or what have you. You seem to have a lot of great knives coming through your hands. How many of those are coming through your hands uh, because you have uh, contacts and how many of those are knives that you're acquiring to put into your collection? Uh, a majority of them are, are ones that I've purchased, um, for, for out of curiosity or out of love. You know, it could be one of the two things. Uh, sometimes I get sent stuff. Uh, I do, I, I'm lucky in the fact that I get to touch a lot of knives. I do. And I get a lot of knives sent, sent to me. But, um, usually what I do with those is I give them away to Patreon members and things like that. Uh, but, uh, it's a good way to see what's out there and see what people have to offer. Do I take everything that people offer me? No, I couldn't. There would be no way. Uh, but one thing that was, uh, speaking of something in, in particular that was sent to me that I've been pretty impressed with, Drop actually sent me um, a new collaboration they're doing with Quiet Carry. Have mm -hmm. you heard of Quiet Carry stuff? Yeah. I had some a uh, couple other things before. Nick Shabazz had sent me one of his to check out. Um I liked it. I liked the knife a lot. I had some things I didn't like about it, but I I did like the knife for what it was. But they sent uh, one of their uh, a new. It looks like a knife, like a Quaken style folder. I think it's been in their yeah. their their lineup for a while. And two, uh, you know, like the key bar things. So they have these little knives. They're like they're probably about this big. One opens to a, a knife, and the other one opens to like a little pry bar or a screw puller and a bottle opener, seat belt cutter. And it's like this big and it's all titanium. It's very well machined. It's not the most refined product in the world, mm -hmm. but at the price point and for what they are, I'm very impressed with them. I've actually put my house keys on it and I've been carrying it around in my pocket and I've never been one that, to enjoy something like that. Well, that's like one of those weird gifts you get from your brother or your cousin exactly. or whatever. And you're like, what? I mean, what am I going to do? And 30 years later, it's still in your junk drawer. You use it every other week. How many, how do you, how many knife fans have I created by doing that? You know? <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so, okay. So this is quiet carry and it's coming out. To yeah. It's just, that's just something that I, uh, that just recently came through. I do have a bit of news that, that oh. I wanted to drop on your podcast. Please. Uh, let's hear it. I don't know if it's something you want to do now or we can do it afterwards. Let, let's do it whenever you want to do it. It's your news. 
Well, uh, in regards to production knives and uh, and Brian Nadeau, you know, he just released uh, the second run of uh, Evo Typhoons. Yes. We just call them the Evos because I feel like it's its own model at this point. And we had a lot of success with uh, the Knife Nuts editions of of the models that we've we've done prior. And I've been getting a lot of uh, questions about, is there going to be a Knife Nuts edition of the Evo Typhoon? The answer is yes. Something I'm I'm emailing companies to get some uh, some different things going for it, but hopefully within the next week I'll have the details for that. All right. Well, you heard it here first. The Evo is coming out in a knife nuts edition. Mm. Uh, what what is that going to look like? Ah, uh, I that I'm not ready to to share, but okay. it'll have some some material. Hopefully, if things go well, it'll have a material that has never been used. At least no, might have been used by Riot in the past, but oh. you haven't you haven't seen it. On anything recent. Interesting. Um, so is there a through line uh, in in the Knife Nuts editions? Is there some material or some aspect of the knife? We try to make it a, a little a, a little bit of an elevated product with unique cues. Something that is you won't see anywhere else. Like we did the the on the Void, for example, we had a completely different blade shape. So it had a, yeah. a, a harpoon and it had uh, Chad Nichols Timascus inlays in the hand rub. I will say this new one will have a hand rub as well, and we'll, and for the first time we'll be offering two blade shapes, so oh, it'll nice. be a cool thing. Well, uh, we we will all keep our eyes out for that. Yeah, I'm excited. What are your criteria when you get a new knife, or or what is it that that sparks your interest when you hear about a new model? Uh, besides, uh, I might know that guy, or I I might be interested in the trajectory of this guy's designs or career. Like, what are the things that draw you in? And then what is the knife against which all others are measured for you? <laughs> uh, that's a tough question. But uh, I will say that, you know, blade to handle ratio is a big thing for me. Um, unless there's some very specific reasoning for it, um, you got to have a, a lot of blade. I want the, I want it to be a very blade. He- generally, I, generally speaking, I like a blade heavy design. Um, obviously looks grind. I, if I can't at this point in time, we shouldn't be dealing with thick grinds. Obviously every tool has its purpose, but for a pocket knife, I want something that's going to cut stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, ergonomics is a big thing. I, the first thing I do when I, ch- when I check a knife, I, I check for lock rock. I check, tra- check for blade play. A pet peeve is any sort of detent play for me. Uh, I can't stand to have, I call it turtle heading when the, when, <laughs> when the blade starts to, wiggle out of out of the out of the frame just a little bit i can't stand that yeah it's you know it's usually something minor but first world problem but it's annoying yeah, as hell it's yeah. one of my pet peeves yeah um, i don't know it, it's it's really the story i guess and and it's very hard for me to get excited about a knife at least at, nowadays it has to be something pretty pretty special so blade to handle ratio is a big thing for me what what do you uh what are your recent favorites that have exceptional Blade to handle ratio. Oh man, it's hard for me to p- pick them up on the on the dot. I love Brian's knives are famous for that. He's always packing as much blade as he can into the handle. That's a big thing for Brian. Um, I love Leong Ma's designs because mm. he does the same thing. I think Leong Ma is still one of the best knife designers out there. He's quirky, but he is a, a, a real he. The amount of thought and the the why he puts into a lot of his designs means a lot. You know, the old eraser and the new eraser. Uh, that that eraser, the the current yeah. generation eraser, is one of the nastiest performing knives out there. I have the all titanium one, so it 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 tapers at the end. It has like a distal taper, um, which is something you don't see yeah. on any knife anymore, where they actually get slimmer towards the back, right. and it's just all blade. Uh, that is a great great knife, and also uh, what's the other one called? Um, the large one that looks like a Strider, but isn't a Strider. Oh. Hmm. The, uh, oh my God. The it's on the tip of my tongue. Evolution? The, nah. No. The, that's that's Rotten Designs. That's a cool looking knife, too. Yeah. That kind of uh, looks like a Strider, I thought. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 what he, you know, that's what he loved. He loved Striders. So, naturally, his design was going to echo what he loved. Well, just to clarify, uh, with the uh, with the rotten design knife, I remember saying, kind of going off at the mouth, saying, "Ah, it looks just like a Strider." And then I looked at them. I'm like, "No, it doesn't. Yeah. It looks just like a Strider. Like a lot of knives look just like a Strider." Yeah, I, I think it was just I, I 
I wanted that knife and I didn't have it and I was feeling a little burnt by it. So <laughs> I, I understand what you're saying. I, I do. I, I like that that design as well. What the hell is this knife called? You mentioned the the grind field duty. It's called the field duty. Field duty. Oh yeah, yeah. I know which one. I know. And exactly he's, which one on the new catalog, he's actually got smaller versions. And I the reason I say it looks like a Strider is because that admittedly was his his inspiration from it. Yeah. And he has a new version of that that's going to be a lower cost uh, with uh, a Strider's frame, like the way the G10 uh -huh. integral frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'll be a cheaper version of the Field Duty with the great slicey full flat grind and everything. It's got a sort of arrowhead shaped blade and yeah. a trapezoidal, not as extreme, but a sort of trapezoidal handle. Yeah, yeah that, that is a cool knife. He designed some cool knives. You mentioned thick grinds and... Um, uh, something that we hear a lot about now is is the uh, the width behind the edge of a blade, and uh, I I'm assuming that's what you're talking about, but I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I, I mean, generally speaking, that's uh, the thinness behind the edge is what's going to determine. It determines a few things. It determines how well that that knife could perform. It could. It also determines the level which the company, the the manufacturer, mac, manufacturer, or the Knife maker, ma knife maker is capable of of uh, doing, you know. So, who do you think does that best right now on a production level? On a production level, you know what I got recently that I was very impressed with was the Hoag uh, RSK, the exclusive one to uh, Knifeworks, I think. Yeah, the mini. The mini. Yeah. yeah. So that starts with some pretty a thinner blade stock than the larger one. And it comes down to such a really nice, acute edge, yeah. and I've really been enjoying using that. Uh, Three Rivers Manufacturing makes a, a very nicely manufactured blade. There, I mean, there's a lot of good ones out there right now. I've I've been shocked. Spider Co. By, you know oh, well, the perennial. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've recently gotten a couple of Civivis in hand: uh, mm -hmm. the Shredder, yeah, and then the Rustic Gent. And I'm kind of shocked by how thin very those nice. things are. Yeah. And I, I feel like, uh, you know what, I can't use this as a screwdriver? Well, you know, what the hell? Oh, you know what's a good one, too? Speaking of Wii, yeah. Wii, Wii products, uh, a couple of the last Elijah Isham designed ones, they were exercises in how thin can I get this edge to be. There's a couple of them out there. They're really wacky looking, very Elijah. I mm -hmm. love them. They're, yeah, they look like they wouldn't work if you were to, you know, look at them in a picture. But once you get them in hand, Amazing, amazing. That there's two that he just released. One that looks like a swayback design. Yes, yes. Um, the Plumora or pl 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 Pluroma, Pluroma, Pluroma. Yeah. And then there was another one that has a Warncliffe, but that Warncliffe is it, you could flex it. That's how cool. It oh is. my god! Yeah, like a, you, like could, a you could you could flex it. Yeah. So what's your favorite blade shape? I, I'm 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 really boring. I'm like the missionary position of blade shapes, man. I like a drop point. Drop point. Yeah. I mean, but I carry I carry a lot of stuff, but by default, I'll go to a drop point if necessary. I'm supposed to pocket check you at the beginning of this interview, and I always forget to do that. But uh, I know what you're carrying. Tell us what you're carrying. Well, honestly, I'm in gym shorts, so I'm not carrying anything at the moment. But I do have this this fake uh, Gonzo Sabenza thing here. With an access lock, oh, so you that. can count that. That's but, I've had that for probably eight nine years. <laughs> all right, what I'm getting at is the sparrow hawk, right? I and know what and, you're doing. and uh, oh my god, you've you have taken so many pictures, adoring pictures of that knife. Uh, tell me about uh, tell me about that knife and your attachment to it. Uh, well, the touch guys are, you know, um, Eric and Bill are you know a father son team. Very old school art knife makers, all handmade, 100% handmade. And literally, like in terms of mechanically and finishing and everything else, it, it's perfect. The, the thing, it's a mechanical masterpiece. It, dual action knives are a, are a very, very high level. I mean, it's a mechanism. Like you're, you're working with like, like a watchmaker would be working. Just describe real quickly what a dual action knife is. Sure. A dual action knife is a knife that can be opened uh, either traditionally, uh, manually, fold the knife out and has a liner lock or some other sort of lock. But it also has a usually hidden um, automatic mechanism in it. So it, it, it technically is a switchblade that can be opened manually if, one, if you want to. So that's the best way I can do it. And, and best way I can describe it. And uh, the Sparrowhawk... 
uh, utilizes its own scale release. So it actually goes the opposite way than what your average scale release knife would go. So uh, I have the uh, LCC, the old Microtech double uh, Great knife. Oh, I yeah. love that, yeah. That is a really cool knife. And you just kind of nudge the bolster up uh, in mm-hmm. one corner, uh, just north, just a touch, and the, and the blade flies out. Mm-hmm. And then when you put it back in, you feel that spring mm-hmm. you know, that you're fighting. Yeah, against. just like you're, uh, you're reloading a spring on, a, on, a, on an automatic knife. Yeah, so so that Sparrowhawk, that's that's one knife, right? Like, because I've seen a lot of pictures of that. Or do you have a collection of those? I have one. I don't. I I actually don't carry it that much. My uh, my buddy. <laughs> it must just stick out because it's man, well, it's fantastic. I, my one buddy, um, he goes by Killer Steel on on Instagram. He's always he you know he's a big fan of of Brian Nadeau. He's a good friend to us and and to. And the touch guys are, they've been on our show and everything like that. And he posts, he carries his a lot. So when I repost a lot of his stuff in my story, you probably see his Sparrowhawk. That's one of his, you know, most carried knives. Like, it's hard for me. I, I would carry it more often, but I'm always got to carry, I'm always carrying something different. You know, it's, uh, if it we're up to me, like usually if I'm doing work, it's my Maximit Para 3. I do carry that a lot. Um, like I was saying that mini RSK, I carry that a lot, that, that Leong Ma eraser, mm. you meant you got to some really good ones. I will tell you, those are all ones that I use very heavily. Um, also the new ProTech Malibu is another one that's been getting a lot of pocket time for me. That's the renaissance of, of button locks right now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So what is your philosophy on collecting? What do you, how do you acquire? What do you keep? I assume you keep things moving to just keep somewhat of a flow. I'm, I actually don't. I, I sell a lot of the production knives that I buy to to experience and and look at and be able to recommend or talk about on the show. But it's very rare that I'll buy a knife for me. You know, uh, sometimes one of those knives, those production knives, will will end up. I'll end up loving. But it's it's very it's not very often that I buy a knife that is 100% mine. You know, I'm and I don't sell those knives. I have a collection of knives that never get sold, especially ones. With makers who I have a relationship with, uh, I don't sell any of that. So uh, the last one I purchased was my Arch Nemesis, which turned out to be a very, very special knife. Uh, it's a zirconium frame. Brian did some amazing mill, mill work on it that's exclusive to the one that he did for me. He anodized the zirconium purple in certain areas. Oh, it's really, really cool looking. And he... He did a chevron blade. You can see I have an arch nemesis on my arm. So <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a it's it's a a knife that I was very heavily involved with when Brian was was discussing it because I remember saying, "Dude, you got to do a dagger. You got to do a dagger." And it's just something that like, it became oh, the logo for. Yeah, it became the logo for our podcast, and it's you know it's it's got a it's so that's a very special knife to me. It's it's one of two folding uh, daggers that I can think of. It's that and the and the Maximus. There's a few out there now, um, but in terms, I I'd lie to you if I didn't say it was the best one. Oh my god! You know, R.J. Martin tried to do one too, and you know, yeah, but he's such a slouch. You know, so. <laughs> we're not gonna go there. We're not gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to get him on the pockets. Maybe I can anger him into it. <laughs> oh, tell him the dough did it. <laughs> yeah, right. Then he'll definitely want to. Where do you stand? I mean, okay, so you you're tied into this community. You have a lot of friends, and uh, where where do you stand on controversies? There are controversies that pop up in the knife world from time to time. There have been some quite recently, and I, I'm just curious. Like, do you maintain a separation between the product and the maker, or how does that work for you? Uh, this is going to be a tough one to answer, but uh, I ju- if the person is getting involved, I'm going to judge on the person. You know. Uh, it's very easy to separate Microtech, suppose, uh, you know, for example, from Anthony Marfion, in my, in my opinion. I think Microtech operates so autonomously from what, uh, Anthony Marfion does or says that, you know, I can see the forest through the trees there and say Microtech makes a great product because I really do think they do. Um, there are certain other companies that, you know, have, too much of them, their opinion, bolstering their fan base, that it just becomes synonymous with their brand. And that's when I t- tend to step away from whatever they're trying to do. When it's an agenda, 
that I'm not really going to follow, then that's a whole other thing than having a knife company, you know? Yeah. And it, it comes down, it's not a political thing, you know, there are plenty, I have plenty of friends that have uh, very different political views, um, you know, that we hang out, we get together, we, ha- we, we love each other. It's, it's not about that. It's about how you present yourself as a human being and, and the way you represent a community. Yeah. Yeah. That's always been uh, something that was easy for me, uh, separating the art from the, the artist when looking at, you know, people who are long dead, you know, Caravaggio. Oh, he was a murderer, but man, his paintings, you know, yeah, hey, right, there you go. <laughs> that's what we're still talking about. So, yeah, uh, it, it always seems funny when when controversies pop up. Like, uh, like, well, you mentioned Anthony Marfino. There was the the thing with the with the matrix or the matrix. No, or the matrix. The, only, the only reason the only reason I brought up Anthony Marfione is because there is a a laundry list of and, uh, of stuff. And it, I am a it, babe in the woods. I want to yeah. ask you offline what those things are. Oh <laughs> God, man! It, it's it's just you talk about separating the art from the artist. The Caravaggio painting. You don't have to be a murderer to like the painting. <laughs> it's when it's when the the painter is saying. You go be a murderer because I. If you like my stuff, you better go murder people. Yeah, that's that's where you draw the line. In yeah, my opinion. <laughs> I think that's where uh, most people, a lot of people, uh, draw. You should the draw line. the line. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, common sense. That's all I. That's all I ask. For. Yeah, 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 and 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 yes, exactly, exactly. So, what what is your what is the knife? You never quite answered this. What is the knife that you measure everything else against? And it could be it could be a guilty pleasure. It could be a Cold Steel Recon One or a or a Emerson Commander. So it's funny, and this sounds like such a setup, but the original Typhoon from Brian was my first custom. Uh-huh. So for me, that told a lot of the story. You know, I took a chance on a maker. You know, that's usually you know my friend. That's my friends are always telling me, "How do you how do you pick all these makers that turn into like uh, very popular people?" I don't know. That's just it looked good. I wanted to touch it. I'm a taste maker. What can I say? Well, the the most the most uh, recent example I'll say is Skiff Skiff made blades. Uh, Steve Skiff and his son, they make an amazing knife. Brian loves them too. So when when you hear Brian up talking mm. a, a a knife, you know it's got to be special because uh, he really really appreciates them. And the same for like the touch knives and things like that. He he loves what they do. You know. So I think the skiff the skiff guys are are uh, one of the brands to watch. They really are. How did you learn about them? How do you learn about new makers? I mean, you see how much I'm on freaking Instagram. <laughs> it never ends. It's a constant, constant stream of stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, I have group chats going with the knife community, like people uh, who review knives. You know, we start are constantly showing each other stuff and. Trying not to influence each other's opinions, however we do. I mean, what's going to happen? Um, but at the same time, we, we all have a good time. We, we all enjoy uh, the hobby. You know, people like like yourself. Like we chat sometimes. We see stuff. You know, it's it's just just the, a natural thing of being so immersed in in an industry. It's an industry more on top of a community and everything else. So, so how have you seen that grow? I mean, you said you've been into knives for twelve years or so. Yeah. Uh, how have you seen that change and grow? I could say that it's gotten better and worse in certain ways. Um, I feel like knives have been sort of vilified to a certain extent with uh, in pop culture and things like that. But they've also gotten more accepted in, in cir- circles where you wouldn't really expect it. I see a lot of celebrities uh, who are into their knives. I saw the Dwayne The Rock Johnson just last week posted his Benchmade. Uh, I mean, it was it was that right really on. bad frame lock, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, it was a nice gift, and he looks like he's a knife guy. Stone Cold Steve Austin. It's per- something with the professional wrestlers. I don't know yeah. what it is, but you know he works very closely with, uh, with Cold, Cold Steel. Steel. And I love Cold Steel, by the way. I think Cold Steel makes a phenomenal knife. They're they're the people laugh them off, but their knives are very 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 good. You are preaching to the choir, yeah. sir. I also love just the the historic tie in. You know, like where yeah. where where else am I going to get a modern Navaja? Yeah, that sure. I see. Like look, 13... look behind you, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> exactly. And and you know, yeah, the high quality. I think people get. Uh, you know, maybe he's got a. Uh, maybe Lynn Thompson has a polarizing personality. Sure. But, I mean, come on. Yeah. He's not Talk, that polarizing. We're talking he's about just a weirdo. You know, he's yeah, like a yeah. knife weirdo. How many? He's of definitely those a weirdo. <laughs> yeah. Quite a few. Yeah. Quite a few. 
Yeah, but that you hit the nail on the head there. That's a great example of separating the the knife from the, the maker or the, the the individual from the from the art. Speaking of uh, of Lynn Thompson and thinking of the proof videos, you know. Oh yeah. For some reason, when Lynn Thompson hacks a, a pig in half, it's ghastly. <gasps> How could they do that? But when uh, Doug Markaita does it on History Channel, it's you know. It's good information about knives and edges. And believe me, I love Doug Markaita and I yeah, love sure. that show. And I, I love seeing dead pigs getting cut in half because I just start thinking about dinner. I, that part, that stuff doesn't bother me because I know what they do with the meat afterward. They donate it. They do, they, it goes to a good cause. I mean, plus butchering is a thing. You got to eat. Yeah. When he starts putting meat inside a shoe, <laughs> <laughs> when it turns into like, look at what you can do to this guy's foot. Yeah. Yeah. He's got a cowboy boot on. There's, there's no a different problem. And, and I, to be honest, I think uh, the stuff on, I, I think that had did a wonders for the knife community. Uh, Forge and Forge fires. And fire. Yeah, I agree. A lot of popularity. You know, you know how many people a day. Hey, do you know about Forge and Fire? No, I never heard of it. Tell me more. Yeah, but uh, there are certain things they do that get you know that get people's attention. And and Doug, my card, I eat will kill. That's something that's there to, for shock value. Yeah. So and and he's all you know he's been in the um, Filipino martial arts world for yeah. a long time. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, he's the and, real deal. And uh, always kind of a kooky guy, or or, or know for it. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I agree. I think I think that show uh, kind of definitely opened things up and, and sure. made it more acceptable. And and people, you know, there is something. I had a um, I used to do kempo karate when I lived in Philly, and uh, we got I, a badass over here. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, oh me, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, who, where? Uh, and my teacher, uh, she was awesome. She was like this James Bond femme fatale. She was gorgeous, a little bit older, and just total badass. But I remember uh, a class was about to start, and everyone stopped and like gathered around this guy who had gotten um, a United Cutlery boot knife, you know, one of those aluminum-handled cash oh, sure. And we were all like, oh, my God, that is awesome. Look, it's got two edges. And, and the whole thing came to a grinding halt. And she was just like, well, what is it with men and knives? It's a thing. It's a thing. So It's definitely a thing. So you're a designer. You're a, uh, you said you've always been into gear and such. My background is fine art. I don't, I don't design knives or anything like that. And a graphic design and things like that. My biggest thing, I used to do album covers for heavy metal bands. So I don't <laughs> want any confusion. I don't design knives. Any, anyone I might have heard of? Probably not. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know <laughs> much metal, but uh, I, I also, sir, have a fine, oh, two fine artists having a fine conversation. Oh, tell me more about knives. Oh, isn't it spectacular? I see what you got in the back there. Is that a, it? Looks like a Degas. That's actually a grandpa. My oh. my grandfather was also an artist. He did that very in, impressionist. I like it. He did that in art school in nineteen like thirty four or something. I love it. Yeah. I think it's great. Oh, thanks. I love texture. That's that's my favorite thing with. Uh, it's very impressionist art style. I like it very much. Oh, thank you. Mm. Tell me what it is about what's happening in the knife world, whether it's a, a, a trend, an actual physical trend in knives or a trend in thought or whatever that has you excited. Um, I think the, the bar for quality is, is creeping up. I think people are starting to become a little more discerning. And it's, uh, it's a natural thing with, with uh, millennials taking over everything. I can say that because I am one kind of, and uh, it's people wanting that experience, you know, over everything else. And I think that that's something that's been very good. I think that's why it has a lot of the the gung ho go America all day long people a little nervous and very you know uh, vocal, mm -hmm. especially with the current situation and everything like that compounding everything. But I hope that means that you know it pushes American manufacturers. And there are great American manufacturers, man. Uh, Protec, I think they're ready to uh, come up and just blow everybody out of the water. If I were to pick a company that was an American manufacturer right now to produce my knife, it would be Protec. There are so many uh, different things I like. The modern traditional thing was, was something that people talk about a lot over the past year and a half, two years. I still see that being something that's a, an easy way for people to get into knives. Uh, you have companies like Civivi offering so much for so little. Um, other Chinese companies coming in saying, look, we're knife fans. We can do this too. Uh, one to be to call out is QSP knives. Mm -hmm. um, things like that. You mentioned Quiet Carry before, and then there's the James brand and, 
and a couple of other uh, that I kind of deride as hipster knives, but I yeah, don't... they're fashion brands. Yeah, but they are they're they're producing high quality products. Sure, but but yeah, they're kind of fashion brands. But I'm not right. I'm not writing it off. But that's that's a, an example of the hipster sort of thing. Like the the millennium, like the idea of something becoming an experience. Look, this is my right. everyday carry. This matches my boots very yeah. well, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that sort of thing. I mean, hey, it's that's things. Yeah. yeah. The James brand is like the poster child for like, not a knife enthusiast brand, but sure, it'll get your feet in the door. Oh, I see you like a Seiko watch. Perhaps you would like this, uh, this James brand, whatever it is. Right, right. But the beauty of that, of course, is that it expands the sure. expe- uh, acceptability. Yeah. So that maybe when I, when I pull out my, my XM24 in the lunchroom, it's not such a shock anymore because they've, they've seen, you know, They've yeah. seen the fashion brands. I think that's probably sure. fashion brands. So what what's your uh current grail knife? Oh. Um like like uh okay, if I said uh, I just so happen to have the knife you want right now. Okay. All right. What what would that knife be? Um so I still want a custom Rogers. I hmm. still want a Ron Best. I am not familiar with Ron Best. Oh, his name is not ironic, man. <laughs> go go and see last name for review <laughs> yeah see last name for review um let's see um what's Derek monroe another metal guy i i really really like his aesthetic getting one of his knives is a little difficult uh sean kendrick uh mm-hmm. is yeah. another one that I, I just because i like that whole aesthetic and I I like his knives too. It's just a if if you can see it's like all over the place sort of thing. Well, you say Sean Kendrick and you say that aesthetic to me, I, I immediately think of my car to handles and some sort of aggressive, sure. cool kind of. Yeah. So what is your what is your aesthetic? I'm not talking about the best knife to carry or the best knife to use in your day to day, whatever you actually use your knives for. But like, what is your? Uh, I like big aggressive knives. What do you? Like? I I do like a, a a larger knife. I think to me. As far as uh, knives, I was just talking to Brian about this too. The Evo Typhoon, and this is why it was a big deal for him to come and do a second run of this. That's one of my favorite production knives and my one of my favorite knives to carry in terms of size, weight, aesthetics. Everything about it is a very purpose-driven design that is still really beautiful. Um, that, to me, is a great example of what I like to see in, in a knife. Um, as far as new ones that are coming out, um, I, Skiff's Drifter, I had the prototype of that for a while. I, I like their knives because they have a unique aesthetic and it might be a little polarizing at first. And then you see it and you look at the hand rub and you look at the milling and you look at every little detail they put on that thing and it's phenomenal. If you haven't got a chance to handle a Skiff, I'll send you uh, one of mine to check out. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You'll well, you'll enjoy it. What what about it? Would you say is polarizing? I don't have one in front of me, but I well, can't think of what. It's just a, they they set out to do a design that doesn't look like anything else. It, a skiff has its own look, uh, whether it's the drifter or the accomplice or anything yeah. else in there. Yeah, they make it has a you know it's a drop point blade, but it's got its own shape. You can tell there was a lot of thought put into it. So that, I mean that's that's the thing I I have uh, in front of me a big giant Medford that I could not would not buy and a beautiful direware solo which is just oh my god i remember you know uh the the direware were the thing to have you know that god. was that was the one so uh dirk warning who's got a, a channel a youtube channel loaned those both to me and you know that's a lot of knife and mm-hmm. we have never shaken hands before we've never you know but we've we've looked each other in the eye uh presumably on on camera here but to me, it's amazing how uh, like how generous and cool people seem to be. Yeah, well, I think you get a certain feel for people um, who appreciate the things you do. Um, and I think if you appreciate the knife, I think you're probably going to treat it with respect. So, yeah, I have no issue. You know, most of the time when I talk to I mean, it's not like, hey, DM me. I'm going to send you a knife. It's going to happen. Right? <laughs> yeah. Everyone listening, levon has got a knife for you to check out. Yeah, try it. See what happens. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I want to do a speed round with you. And oh, this, great. this is really, I mean, the whole interview is going up to this to really dive deep into your soul and find out yeah. what you're all about. Okay. Break you down into about 15 different dimensions. I probably could use that. Maybe leave some of them off while you're at it. <laughs> all right. First, fixed or folder? Ah, folder. Flipper or thumb stud? Mm, 
Let's go thumb stud. Today. 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 I- I'm sensing not such a commitment to these answers. Well, you know, it's it's just like it depends on the right thing for the right knife. That's all. That's the way I see it. You know, and for the mood, I would imagine. And for the mood, and like, the hey, I want to carry. I do like a flipper. I I would say I'm fifty fifty on a flipper thumb stud situation. Okay, gun to your head. Oh, that's I mean, flipper because that's my my typhoons and everything else are flippers. So. Okay, all right. That's all I need to know. Washers or bearings? There's something to be said about uh, a knife that's made on washers. You know, uh, there's something to be said about that. Um, I do think bearings have have their place as well. Tip up or tip down? Oh, tip down. What a, tip, who, I mean, who does that? Do I want tip down? Oh, tip up. Tip up. Tip up. Yeah. <laughs> I was confused. I know. I, I got you. I tested you there. It, it happens. Yeah, it has it happens. to be tip up. But then I always remember, I, I, can't, I think in all situations, I want the tip up if I have the choice. Uh, Tanto or Bowie? A uh, Bowie. Okay. So do you say Bowie or Bowie? I try to say Bowie, but I usually echo what the other person says. Okay. So I, I have finally decided, I'm from Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, right now I live just a hair south of the Mason Dixon and everyone oh. here says Bowie. And I'm like, wait, I'm a Yank. I say Bowie. So I say, I- I'm trying to get myself back to Bowie. Well, I try to distinguish between David Bowie and a Bowie knife. So ah, well, that's the way go. I, that's the way I say it. They both cut both ways. Oh yeah. Hollow ground or flat ground? Ooh, that's, that's a whole debate, man. <laughs> I, I, th- I, I think a hollow, it has to be the right thing for the right knife, but. I, I think a full flat grind, not just like a flat V grind or something mm-hmm. like that, but a full flat grind for like everyday tasks. As long as you end up with that nice, that nice thin edge, you're, that's, you're golden, man. That's going to get you to where you yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Full size. We all like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> full size or small. Full size. Yeah. Gentleman's knife or a tactical knife. Yeah. Somewhere in between. No, 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 no. no. You don't get that choice. Gentleman's uh, knife or tactical knife. I hate to call it tactical, but I guess that's probably what most of them would would be considered. Sure, okay. we'll go with that. Okay, automatic or bally song? Oh, automatic for sure. ZT or Riot? Riot. Benchmade or Spyderco? Oh, Spyderco. Real steel or S- steel will? Which I always confuse. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, right now, I'm I'm on the I'm in the real steel band camp, yeah. but. But I do love the Real Steel guys. They are Pennsylvania-based brand. Uh, I mean, the Steel Wheel guys. Steel Wheel, yeah. Steel Wheel guys. Uh, they're great people. I like their knives, too. I, I, I think they're both really impressive companies. Mm-hmm. And um, but, uh, for some reason, I, it's just small-mindedness. I confuse them. I confuse them. Oh, yeah. Them. I mean, it's, e- it's easy to do. Uh, milled titanium or spring clip? Oh, man. Uh, I, this is tough, man. I... Like again, because there's so many crappy. Think about spring how ugly clips this knife is going to look when you when you answer all these questions. Yeah, there's. I, I mean, give me a bent clip. I'll take the bent clip. It's probably going to work better than ninety percent of the milled ones. I, I'm agreeing with you. Might not look as good, but it depends on. I mean, I've had some great knives with milled clips, and I wouldn't have them any other way. But yeah, if push comes to shove, you know. So uh, carbon fiber or micarta. Ooh. Carbon fiber. Do you have a certain kind? I'm curious. I te- I, I don't know, man. Like, I, I don't yeah. like the monotonous regular weave, but everything else seems cool. Did you see the post that I did with the four Adam Purvis yes, blades? Yes. That was just four different types of carbon fiber right there on four different versions of his knives. I like the stuff. I mean, I'm a car guy, so I even when I was a kid, I was like, oh, carbon fiber. <laughs> yeah. So and that still has a thing. I love my car too. So, but if I push them, I mean, I like, I like. It depends on the micarta and it depends on the carbon fiber because there's a lot of variance in, in between. The, all, all, the, the cool thing about all four of those knives and the carbon fiber, they were all irregular. You mm-hmm. know, they all had some sort of interesting well, the one, random there was Well, there was one that had more of a traditional, which is technically the best. It's the most um, stable. Stable. I like marble carbon fiber as a general aesthetic. I like the idea of that forged look. Yeah, but if you push it, it's going to fall apart. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. my God, the voids. <laughs> the voids. Mm. Uh, finger choil or no choil? No choil. That's ah, the most, thank you, uh, sir. That, is, that, uh, that strikes a chord with me. Unless the knife is designed, like we talked about, like a strider or something like that. That's part of the design of that yeah. knife. That's the only time I think a choil is acceptable. If there isn't choice between having another place to put a finger and having half the knife stick out over here <laughs> or having more blade, I'll take more blade yeah, yeah. any day. Yeah. 
There's more room for your finger, but guess what? The blade's shorter. Didn't um, Hinderer just release some non-choil they do versions it through, of through DLT? They they do exclusives. That has me interested. I'm not a. I like Hinderer. I'm not a, like a Hinderer guy, oh. but that those do have me interested. If they did like the slicer grind or something like they've that, they've done the slicer grind. Yeah. They've done the they've they did a choil drop point, or they they did a a fuller drop point, and then they did the Warncliffe, which is spectacular. The Warncliffe, though, is it always looks a little short, you know, because that's the it's very difficult to package a Warncliffe. But they did a choilless this Warncliffe. They did it right in the twenty four. The twenty four, mm. it has the space to expand and and have its full graceful. I know what you're talking about. It's kind of I like, like a Warncliffe, but you end up selling yourself short. No pun intended. No, no, no. I I understand because it it also has to have it also has to be stabby for me. It yeah. can't it can't be too much like the like the cleaver. Anyway, okay, form or function. Uh, I think one leads to the other, so function. Okay. And then finally, uh, this is one knife for the rest of your life, your desert island knife. And it's not for survival on a desert island. It's just that one knife that you keep for the rest of your life. Man, that's tough. Uh, probably one of Brian. Brian look, look at this right now. Like It's like clockwork. Look who's look at this. <laughs> He's getting a call from Leong Ma. How cool is that? Hey, man, what's up? <laughs> he, he heard me talking about him. Yeah, right. Uh, Ears were ringing. Well, uh, Levon, I, I, I'm going to let you go so you can talk to Leong Ma, but before I do... I'll call him back. Yeah, it just sounds so cool to say it like that, though. <laughs> uh, but before I do, uh, let everyone know where they can catch up with uh, the Knife Nuts podcast and uh, your collection, your work, your take on your knives and your collection. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you'll see me ever present on Instagram. I'm, you know, at Knife Nuts Podcast, all one word. You can listen to everything we have to offer. You can see our exclusives and our merch for, through KnifeNutsPodcast.com. Um, you can check out SharpByDesign.com and, and all of us. You can get to everyone on the podcast through my Instagram profile. Stay tuned. Uh, next week, we'll, ha- we'll hopefully be uh, have the Knife Nuts Evo Typhoons ready to go. So that will be a uh, an announcement uh, as to when the Knife Nuts edition of the Evo Typhoon. Yeah, Evo. I assume that'll be sometime late next week. The announcement may come sooner than that, but hopefully if things go well um, and all these pieces fall into place literally and figuratively, um, that'll be a, a, a thing for next week. Well, no doubt people are going to freak out and jump all over it. And so. uh, it'll be, I'm sure it'll be sold out in the mm. blink of an eye. Uh, Levon from the Knife Nuts podcast, Instagram, and 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 elsewhere. It's been a real pleasure meeting you and talking with you. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very very much. Really, you're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Call the Knife Junkie at seven two four four six six four four eight seven with your questions or comments. All right, back on episode number one hundred twenty eight of the Knife Junkie podcast. Great interview with Levon from the Knife Nuts podcast. We'll have. Uh, Links to the Instagram as well as the Knife Nuts podcast. If you uh, have not heard of it and are not yet subscribed, we'll have a link in the show notes at thenifejunkie.com slash 128. Bob, I always uh, kind of wrap up the show, giving you the final word, key takeaway. Uh, what do you want to leave us with today? It was just funny. Uh, while, while speaking with Levon, I, I was scrawling madly all these names and things, <laughs> but mostly names. These are people I want to reach out to, people I want to investigate further. And, uh, you know, it was really, it was really great to meet him, and also um, just to kind of start to benefit from his uh, font of knowledge. So yeah, I have this long list of names of people I'd like to reach out to. Not sure if they'd be interested in talking to us, but uh, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty cool to have someone like Lavon out there who who's kind of a central hub because he seems to know everyone and everything about the knife business. So all right, there you go. Reach out never hurts to ask. <laughs> Right. And a uh, quick reminder, this uh, coming Thursday, it's Thursday Night Knives, the July 16th episode. That's when we'll have our uh, knife giveaway for the Patreon group. So if you're not yet a member of the Knife Junkies Patreon, do so. And next Sunday for our interview show, Bastinelli Creations, Bastinelli Knives, Bob, that's coming up next week. Yep, that's right. Bastien Coves, a uh, uh, Frenchman in America, making the most amazing and beautiful tactical knives and that. Uh, I've been following him for a while, and it's it's uh, it's going to be a great pleasure to talk to him. All right. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie person, saying thanks so much for joining us on the Knife Junkie Podcast. 
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.